All right, how's it going, everyone? Brian Zimmerman here, executive editor of Jazz Is Magazine. Want to welcome you to another episode of Jazz Is Live. And of course, not just any episode of Jazz Is Live, but a Miles Monday episode of Jazz Is Live. That's right, today is Monday. And you know what we do on Mondays? We celebrate all things Miles Davis. To do that, I will be joined, as always, by my co host, drummer Vince. Wilburn Jr., nephew to Miles Davis, uh, and I will also be joined by our very special guest today. That would be the one, the only Christian McBride. Now, Christian is a six-time Grammy-nominated bassist, band leader, and composer. He is the only bassist to win a Grammy for Best Improvised Jazz Solo, as a matter of fact. Um, he's also the host of the radio program, Jazz Night in America, which is produced by NPR and WBGO, so you may have heard him on the airwaves that way. And he's the artistic director of Jazz House Kids, a not-for-profit arts and, entertain and entertainment organization that helps students gain an artistic edge using jazz as a teaching tool to build a foundation based on music, mentoring, education, and apprenticeship. That is a beautiful thing. Uh, he has a new album called For Jimmy, Wes, and Oliver coming out September 25th on Mac Avenue Records. It's with his big band, and it's a tribute to Jimmy Smith, Wes Montgomery, and Oliver Nelson. Now, all of those cats are definitely worth celebrating, but today we are celebrating Miles Davis. And to do that, please, let's welcome my co-host, Vince Wilburn Jr., and our special guest, Christian McBride. What's up, guys? Hey. Yo, 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 yo. What up, hey, Sumac? Hey. <laughs> Great to see y'all, man. Thank you so much for being here, guys. Really appreciate that. Cool, man. Cool. So, Christian, man, aside from the fact that your Philadelphia Eagles lost last night, to a no-name Washington thanks team. Thanks for starting it off with that. <laughs> and, and the fact that my Miami Marlins just bumped your Philadelphia Phillies oh. out of second place. Oh, the NL East. Other than those two things, how you doing, man? <laughs> <laughs> how has life been? <laughs> hey, Chris, don't hang, don't hang up. Don't hang up. Uh, That's right. right. I, hey, let me get that. Let me get that lemon rind tea. I, did, I probably I did. I surprised this one on Vince, man. He doesn't know I was going to start this way. No, That's all jokes great. aside, how great. you been, man? How have you I, been? I, I, how I've been have, okay, man. Okay, I've been okay. okay. I have, I have uh, you know, as well as any of us could be doing under the circumstances. You know, we haven't been able to really play any gigs or go travel. I mean, you know, there have been a few people who have been bold and have done it anyway, but um, I tend to. Uh, I, I don't I don't like to gamble like that. So uh I've been staying close to the house, you know, staying close to my wife and um you know, walk the blocks around the neighborhood, the, the, my dogs around the neighborhood and that's about it. That's good, man. Well, I'm glad you're playing it safe. You have been busy yeah. though. We've been seeing you live streaming. We were just talking about the Jazz Aspen Snowmass uh program over there for students. You appeared virtually for that. So, we are certainly right. glad you're keeping busy, man. Um and you've got a new album on the way. I kind of want to start off talking about this because it works its way nicely into Miles Davis. Um the new album for Jimmy Wes uh and Oliver Coming out September 25th. It's a big band, but you've got a nice special guest on there. Uh, Joey De Francesco is on there. You do some beautiful organ work there. And that's where I'm playing the, the Six Degrees of Miles Davis. Because if I'm not mistaken, you and Joey have had an interaction with Miles way back in the day, right? One of your first interactions with Miles, correct? Uh, my own, well, my first of two interactions with Miles. Wow. Um, <clears throat> this happened in uh, 1987, in the fall of 1987. Uh, Miles was asked to be a guest on this morning talk show in Philly. Okay. And um, Joey D. Francesco, myself, and uh, and our our drummer from our high school band, uh, Stacy Dozier, uh, we played. You know, the, 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 it was the what was it called? Um, Time Out with Bill Boggs. The show was called, and. Um, Instead of just having Miles do an interview and talk about the new record, which was two two at that time, okay, um, mm -hmm. they decided they wanted to uh, kind of add a little extra and have like these young trumpet players from the Philadelphia public school system <laughs> come and play for Miles, and Miles wow. would critique them on live television. Now, if that's not dicey, I don't know. <laughs> I was what just going to say, you know? oh my God, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So let's just say the the only good thing that came out of it that day was that. Miles heard Joey and fell in love with him and took him on the road. Took him on the road. Wow, yeah. man. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
And uh, yeah, I mean, I know Miles loved Oregon. Vince, didn't My Miles played quite a bit of Oregon, right? Yes, he did. Yeah. He started in 1974, Farfisa, Oregon. Then he was one of the first endorsees at Yamaha. And right. they gave him a Yamaha organ. Yeah, man. He, he was, and then and then when I was in the band, he was playing these Oberheims. Wow. He had these OBX eights. Yeah. You know, Very with cool, the organ man. sound, organ patches. Yeah. 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 So Chris, that was the first time you met Miles? Yeah, that was that was the first time I'm well, that's the only time I actually met Miles. The the oh, only man. other interaction I had with him was was over the telephone. Okay. Uh, courtesy okay. of Joey. Uh hmm. after after we graduated high school, um Joey had a gig at Indigo Blues. I know Vince, you remember that club? Oh well, yeah, in, in New York, right? On Forty Sixth Street, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah. I had a gig there with Joey, and um, you know we had a our rooms were right in the hotel above the club. Uh, I was in in the uh, Ed Edison Hotel, and um, Joey and I had adjoining rooms, and he was on the phone with some. I didn't know who he was on the phone with, but when I walked in. He was on the phone. He said, hey, you remember my friend I was telling you about the bass player? Yeah, he just walked in. Why don't you say hello? And uh, I, I didn't know he was talking to. So he said, uh, hey, man, pick up the other phone. So I, I picked up the other line. I was like, hello? Hey. Ooh. I was like. <laughs> it's him. <laughs> Whoa. Um, I, I can't quite say what he said, but, I, you know, he said something like, uh, Hey man, Joey said you was a bad blank blank. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> it's the highest form of praise. I called you a blank exactly. blank. Start with yeah. M. Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> exactly. And then we got an F in there somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, how about on a listening level? You know, I know I ask this question a lot. And it's hard for people to put their finger on when they started listening to Miles Davis. Um, but as you think back growing up in Philly, learning to play, when did Miles, you know, and those records sort of enter the equation for you and how? Well, I think, first of all, the first jazz song I ever learned how to play, it was either, um, well, see, what happened was when I was in middle school, um, that's kind of when I started. Not only is that when I started playing the acoustic bass, but that's yeah. all. That's yeah. also when I fell in love with jazz. I was 11 years old, and you know how it is in the public school system. Most of the music teachers were also professionals, you know, so they would teach at school during the day and do gigs at night. So, uh, one of the music teachers at our school, uh, he taught brass. His name was Mark Johnson, and um, he had a real book. I, I didn't know what a real book was, but yeah. he said. Um, you know, I, I need to teach you about some jazz. And one of the first songs I've learned how to play was uh, Satin Doll. And the other one was So What? And I remember him saying very clearly, he said, you need to learn So What? Because the bass plays the lead. And uh, as a bass player and you learning this music, you got to learn So What? That's that's like, you know, that's like learning a C major scale. You got to yes, learn So yeah. What? <laughs> and um, I got so excited to learn So What? Uh, I told my great uncle, who's also a bass player, uh, I said, Uncle Howard, I learned this song called So What? Do you have a recording of So What? And he said, "Do it. now, this vinyl collection you see behind me? Yeah. So my, my great uncle's vinyl collection is about three times this, right? Wow. And so uh, I just grew up around all of these, his, his great album collection. And uh, he said, man, I got like 10 different recordings of So What? Um the, now, interestingly enough, he did not pull out Kind of Blue first. The first version mm -hmm. of So What I ever heard was Miles Davis Live at Carnegie Hall from 61. A little more up-tempo, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's actually the first version of So What I learned. Mm -hmm. uh, so by the time I heard the Kind of Blue version, I remember thinking like, wow, they play it so slow. <laughs> 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 you know, but... Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that Miles Davis Live at Carnegie Hall album was probably, uh, that was my first Miles Davis album. That was the way in. That was the way in. Yep. I've got an acoustic bass behind me. I can play two things. I'm a trumpet player. Uh, that's my main axe. But I got the, I could play So What and a Blues and G that doesn't go above third position. That, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's all I know. That's, cool. that's all I know. Right on, man. But at the same time, so as you're working your way into classic Miles, you know, this was during Miles' period where he was getting into the more electric stuff. 
And oh, he was already in the electric stuff. Exactly. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. This is the 50th anniversary of Bitches Brew, if I'm yes. not mistaken. Mm -hmm. What impression did those, you know, because you're studying acoustic bass, you're making your way into the classic, classic stuff. You're kind of at a cool position because they both converged on you at the same time. So what was your impression of those albums hearing at the same time? Um, gosh, uh, I remember being excited to hear Bitches Brew because I read about it before I heard it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My, my great uncle also, you know, he, he's the one responsible for getting me into this music. Uh, so he turned me on to Carnegie Hall and he also gave me a, a um, he had a, a stack of old downbeat magazines and he said, you take, sorry, jazz is, no, you see, that's he, all right. We love, me, we love them. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he, he gave me a big stack of downbeat magazines. And he said, you know, read up, read yeah. up on this and, yeah. and, and learn about the history. And so I remember reading about Bitches Brew before I heard it. So when I finally did hear it, I loved it. I thought mm. it was like the, you know, I, I mean, because, you know, by the time this happened, this was the early 80s. Right. So like hearing electric music was no big deal for me. You know, it was just kind of right. like, oh, okay. Yeah. Miles is funky too. All right, right solid. Right. I, I can get with that, you know. Um, and then by the time I saw Miles live for the first time, I mean, it, I was just, I was just excited. And 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 this brother on the chat with us tonight was playing drums. <laughs> what, what, oh what yeah, city? when was that? Yeah, what, yeah. What city was that too? Was that that city? was in Philly. Yeah. Yep. Okay. That was in uh, in 1986, and BB uh, King opened for y'all. Wow! Wow! Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Wait a minute. It might have been 85. Okay. Okay. 85, 80. Because I know I saw I saw Miles like five, yeah. four years in a row. It was, you know, it, was a, it was a theater, right? It was outdoors. It, the Academy, Academy of Music. No, this was. Oh, okay. This yeah, was yeah. A, that, a that was 85. That was 85. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was there for that. All right. Hey, all right. hey, Christian, I have a question. Yeah. When your uncle started you out telling you to, to check out Upright, you were you was already you were already playing electric, right? Yes. Yep. Correct. Now, were you playing electric? With Questlove and those guys at eleven, or did when you got in high school? I didn't meet Questlove till I got to high school. We we grew up in the same neighborhood and didn't even know it, man. We wow. we literally grew up three blocks from each other, and uh, we didn't meet until high school. Uh, but but when we met, you know, it was it was like you know we were kindred spirits. Mm -hmm. Well, it was interesting because like I I was sort of like the um, I was the conduit between like Joey and and Amir. And and Kurt Rosenwinkel was there with us as well. So oh, right. all four of us were like yeah. into some other kind of, you know, Joey was hardcore into the organ yeah. and, and 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 blues kind of oriented stuff. I was into straight ahead jazz and and funk. And Amir was mostly only in the funk and like mm -hmm. old school R and B. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so like I was the one cat that kind of knew a little bit about of what each person was listening to, you know. Wow. Um, Kurt was, um, he was probably the first cat that I knew who was very much into like Frank Zappa and the Mahavishnu Orchestra uh, and all that kind of stuff. So we had quite a diverse mix of uh, listeners in our high school rhythm section. Yeah, but, man. But that, that's the key to keep your mind yeah. open, right? Yeah. yeah. Got to keep your mind open, man. Yeah, There's yeah, so yeah. much music out there. You can't decide that, you know, I'm, I mean, you can concentrate on learning one thing, but you can't consciously say something else is not worthy of listening to and, and learning from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was Yuri Kane another guy that you were growing up with at the time? Because uh, I know you guys did the Philadelphia experiment. Yeah, I mean, he, he's yeah. older. Than, he's okay. he's like a generation older than me. Okay. But um, he, I when I was in high school, I started playing with a local band called the Joe Sutler Big Band. Joe Sutler is a, a, a great baritone saxophonist, local legend in Philly. He's uh, a yeah led a band there for many, many years. And uh, most of the cats that played in his band are the former members of MFSB. Oh. And so uh, that's where I kind of got a chance to, that was like my first real steady professional gig. You know, I had, we, we had to wear tuxedos on every yeah. gig and we, the, the band books were like that big. You know, yeah. they were like 250 <laughs> songs. Big binders. Oh yeah. Oh man. It's like 250 <laughs> songs in the bass yeah. book, you know, yeah. and uh you know, we play weddings, private parties, grad. We play all kinds of stuff, and so uh, anyhow, Ori was in that band, oh, and man. that's how I met Ori Kane. Okay, hey Christian, and, and uh, you know, funny you say that because people don't know because they try to lock us into one style of music. 
But yeah. when you when you coming up like growing up in Chicago, you have to be able to play all types of music, everything, everything, everything. and probably you too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, we played polkas, we played yeah. jazz, we played funk, we played blues, we played played it all. That's right. You know, whatever we got called for. That's yeah. that's what you got to do. And and surely a city like Chicago, man, you know, like like Philly, like Detroit, you know, it's like. There's such it's such a great breeding ground, you know. Yeah. What I mean, like you, you gonna learn all that stuff. They said you know? the they said the funk brothers in Detroit was they were steeped in jazz. They were jazz players. Yeah, you know? jazz absolutely. Was, you know, that's right. Man, sure, man. Heavy. And you talk about listening to everything. I know one big influence on both you and Miles Davis was the Godfather James Brown. Oh, um, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about your listening history with James Brown and just what he did? differently and how he changed the game. By the way, before you answer that question, Christian, we see some questions coming in already on our Facebook page. That's excellent. Thank you so much. We'll get to those. Yeah. At the end of the show. And I just want to remind people watching on either Christian or Vince's Facebook page. If you have a question um, for anyone on the show today, feel free to leave it on the jazz's Facebook page comments and we'll get to it at the end of the show. So Sean, we will answer your question. Rest assured. Uh, but anyway, Christian, sorry to cut you off, man. No, JB, no, no problem. James Brown, James Brown, man. Um, it's hard to remember kind of when I discovered James Brown because I feel like uh, he was always there, you know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, when I was born in 1972, James Brown was already a legend, you know. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, hearing his music is almost like hearing my parents' voice. I just know it, you know what I mean? Love that. Um, I love that. Yeah. But I think uh, the first time I saw him, that's kind of what did me in because I'd never mm -hmm. seen like, uh, it's like uh, it's like the Tasmanian devil was actually a real person. You know? <laughs> this energy spinning Incarnate. around so yeah. fast, man, yeah. and just like I was like, man, this cat, I've never seen anything like that. And um, it was on the midnight special, mm. and uh, mm. that 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 destroyed me, man. Like, okay, hearing the music is one thing, but actually then then seeing him, I I I just he became like my main my main muse, you know, and I, I have another uncle, my mother's brother. Uh, he passed away many years ago, but um, he used to work for a popular radio station in Philly, WHAT. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, I was fortunate that I was, you know, between my uncle and my mom and, and my dad and my great uncle, they were taking me to live shows all the time. And, um, you know, I just had access to all of this great music. And so when I saw the midnight special, I asked my uncle Butch, uh, my mother's brother. Um, I said, "Hey, you got any James Brown records?" And he like laughed at me, like, "Are you kidding? Do I have James Brown records? Come on, man!" And so he took me over to his house, and uh, just like what you see behind me, um, he had a huge vinyl collection. Most of that stuff was, was a lot of promos that he'd gotten through the radio station. Yeah. But um, he said, "You want to hear some James Brown records?" And he basically said, "That whole top row." It's yeah. all James Brown. <laughs> Just pick whatever you want to hear. Yeah. And, um, and we became uh, James Brown groupies, man. Well, he already was a James Brown groupie. I just didn't know. Um, and then probably from 1982 all through up until the time I moved to New York, we never missed one James Brown concert within a 50-mile radius of Philly. Wow, man. Yeah. Wesley Taylor wants to know. It's an impossible question, but Wesley wants to know your favorite JB song. Or song yeah, that's, plural. <laughs> that's that's impossible. I, I will tell you, I, I do have a very soft spot for soul power, and I'll tell you why. Yeah. Because um all these James Brown songs I, I, I studied and I loved, and you know, I'll be listening to the record. Like anybody who grew up loving James Brown, you listen to the record and you try to do the dance moves like you remember him doing to that song, you know, in, in the living room, you know. Um, but when I first heard Soul Power. I remember thinking, man, the bass player sure is killing on this. You know, I get a sense that the bass player on Soul Power is not the same bass player as on these on these other James Brown records. Um, and then much later, I found out it was a 19 year old Bootsy Collins playing wow, with James Brown. Wow, 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 yeah. wow! So, you, you know, you know, man, it's funny that you say that too because I'm just a few years older than you, Christian, but. <laughs> Uncle Miles told me to to to, to he sent me because we they had record you know your uncle was at a, worked at a station right right 
and they used to have record uh, uh regional record guys record um the work sure. right right so he is a guy granville white he asked mr white to take the james brown the big payback to my parents house and he said i want you to learn that backwards and forwards wow and then, there was a song called take some leave some that's right that's correct yep. for our yep. listeners check out the big payback and go right to take some leave. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Right. And then I yeah. and then I had the pleasure of meeting Clyde and, and Jabo, you know. Yes. And man, they said one night Miles was up in the wing. Yeah. And, and he came out when they finished and he and he told both of them, he said, Y'all some bad right, 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 right. <laughs> the ultimate yeah. 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 That's the right. Ultimate <laughs> what what yeah. was it like when you when you started working with them, Christian? And, you know, like what was that like? Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you my favorite, one of my all-time favorite, if possibly not my favorite, James Brown story. I mean, um, like the first time, like when you, you know, like, were you like, oh. <laughs> Star yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, well, like, it, it's, it's such a long story, but like the first time I actually got a chance to play with him was at his, uh, he used to have a big all-star birthday bash in Augusta every year. Okay. Okay. And uh, the first time I got invited, you know, it was like, you know, it's like the highest honor. Like, yeah. Had I had I died at that point, it would have been okay because I got, uh, you know, an invitation from James Brown to play at his birthday bash, and um, yeah. So he called me out on stage, you know, and and some other cats, some other special guests that that night, and uh, he invited us to come and sit in, mm -hmm. and um, I'm pretty sure that I was the only guy who the only guest that sat in that night that knew all of the cues. I knew all of the hand signals and <laughs> the other guys in the band, they were laughing because uh, James Brown was like, uh, we got a song called jam. And you know, all the guys in the band were like, okay, it's in G. And, and I was like, I know it. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> and so James Brown turned around and went, boom, you know, dropped his hand and I was yeah, on it. Yeah. And all the, all the guys in the band were like, Oh, shit, damn. Yeah, right? yeah, man. And, uh, and then the next time uh, wasn't until, um, I produced that concert at the Hollywood Bowl, which I was, was uh, one of his last concerts. Yes, wow. you were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And uh, wow. yeah, that was definitely the, um, that, that was a special night, you know, because uh, James Brown was already, you know, he was, he was quite ill by mm -hmm. that point already. And, you know, he um, wasn't moving quite as fast as he had been, you know, and, uh, but it didn't matter. You know, it was, it was like James Brown. I had a chance to spend a lot of time with him and talk with, talk with him and hang with him. Up until you know, inside the time of that birthday bash in 1997 and that Hollywood and that Hollywood Bowl concert, uh, there was quite a saga in there. But um, we had dinner at Victor's Cafe in New York, and uh, we sat at this table, and we were talking about jazz. And uh, I asked Mr. Brown about Miles Davis because obviously we all know how much you know James Brown had what an influence he had on miles. Yep. And James Brown, of course, um, there's confidence and then there's James Brown. <laughs> like, um, I don't think most people could have that kind of confidence. Right. Yeah. And so, um, he says that, uh, I said, M Mr. Brown, what do you think of miles Davis? And, uh, I thought he was going to say something like, uh, Oh, you know, miles was a great artist and, you know, he influenced a lot of people. He said, uh, you know, see, you know, Miles, Miles, check me out. Miles is James Brown, man. That's true. That's true. That's true. That's true. He's not lying. He's not lying. He's not lying. He's not lying. But it, it was just beautiful how none of what Miles did mattered to him except what he influenced. Right. Right. He said, yeah, right. see, you know that, you know, when Miles went, you know, he did On the Corner and yeah. Live Evil, all that stuff, Bitches Brucey, that's, that's all me. <laughs> <laughs> he loved Miles. He did. He loved Miles, right? Yeah. Oh, and, and, and Sly. And Sly and Family Sly. Yes. Big time. Big time. Absolutely, man. Well, because they all kind of embody something that your music embodies, Christian, which is, you know, this notion of people music. I mean, you, you made an album about it, you know, which yes. is that the music called jazz is not... A muse it's not museum music. It is It is supposed to be people's music. It was originally a dance music. It was a popular music. That's not to say it can't be intellectual, you know, and serious That's because right. it is. That's right. um, but this is is very much a, a people's music, 
you know, and and your album speak to that, as did Miles, as did James Brown's, you know, and it, it's amazing to see the overlap, you know, just on a purely musical level, too. You know, you take a groove like Ain't It Funky, you take a groove like So What, you know, you just see that it's it's freedom to explore in these grooves, these vamps, you know, so uh, it's an, well, it's an know, amazing I, lineage. I, I always feel like um, you, you can play the highest intellectual music you want to play, but um, you got to be able to meet people where they are. You know, you can't just you just can't just throw the music out there and, you know, just not really have some sort of a an idea of what the audience might like, what they might want. You know what I mean? And what you need to give them for them to be in your corner. So I, I always feel like because um, see, like Cannonball Adderley had this really great saying, like. Um, I give the audience 50 percent of what they want to hear. And fifty percent of what I think they need to hear. That's right. You know? yeah, that's and right. if you give them what they want to hear, when you lay what they need to hear, they're going to be in your corner. That's mm -hmm. right. You know. Right. Yeah. And I heard Chick Corea, like Chick, made one of the greatest statements I ever heard about Miles Davis. And uh, Herbie said basically the same thing in that in that documentary. Um, what, 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 is that a Miles Electric Blue? Is that the one that that documentary? About Miles going electric, the the, the Isle yeah. of White yeah. DVD, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, um, you know, basically, Chick was saying he really, it, it yeah. just really yeah. gets to him when he hears people, uh, uh, making that myth, you know, giving that whole myth of Miles didn't care about the audience credence. You know, Chick was like, I can't stand like people mm -hmm. still like to make that myth. They they put life into that myth. He said, let me tell you something, Miles was always acutely aware of what the audience was digging. And, you know, he, he knew that. He said, Miles, he, he, he described him as the greatest dramatic actor in the history of jazz. Christian, I was like, would, wow, that's, that's kind of hip. He would, yeah. he would, um, he would um, hey, Jeff, hey, Jeff, 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 I'm getting some, Jeff, some revert, um, oh, echo. Some echo. Anyway. Yeah, that. He would, he would, you know, can you guys hear me? We yeah. got you. And then and then he would critique us and then and then fine tune it. And then the next night he would he would change the set list based on wherever we were in the, in the world. And he could right right away he would call another tune. He like he would change the set list because he had that feeling on how the audience was responding. Yeah. And it yep. was the most amazing thing, man, to, 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 to witness that, you know. Yeah, man. So, but uh it was heavy. And Electric Miles is, is the name of that, that documentary, I think it was. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. And that actually, and it might be, Christian, I don't know if you have headphones or anything, but that may help with the reverb, although it seems oh, like yeah. you're, you're looking good. But it's uh, it's a good segue to uh, Sean's question, now that you bring up Chick Corea, because you got your start, Christian, playing with the elders, man. You know, Freddie Hubbard, Benny Golson, Chick Corea included. Sean's question is, um, and I can see if we could pull this up. Christian, can you kindly speak to how it felt to play with Chikoria generally, the dichotomy of playing with a musician that played with Miles before you were born? Uh, you know, we talk a lot about on this show how Miles' influence trickles down, um, you know, from player to player to player. So um, I don't know if you've had any clear memories of playing with Chick and maybe conversations you had about Miles in Chick's group. Yeah, you know, um, one thing I've always appreciated about somebody like Chick, somebody like Herbie, um, mm -hmm. they 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 demystify jazz. You know, um, people like Miles Davis, Art Blakey, John Coltrane, uh, they are otherworldly, larger than life figures, right? And we somehow in, in, in many ways don't think of them as human. Like if we weren't able to be around them, then we're just not going to be good. Right. Yeah. Like somehow, like if you miss that boat, then sorry, you just aren't going to be that good. Mm -hmm. And when I hear people like chick talk about miles in this way, like, you know, he was a person. Yeah. He was a bad dude, but I mean, he was just, he was a great band leader who was a human being. You know, mm -hmm. they say the same thing about Art Blakey. 
Mm. Uh, they say the same thing about John Coltrane. And like, um, I would ask uh, Chick, like, you know, like there's this thing, like, if I'm playing with Chick Corea, that somehow I say to myself, okay, well, we're rehearsing with the trio. What was it like when he was rehearsing like Miles Davis? Or oh, rehearsing with Miles Davis? And when you ask Chick that question, Chick is like, we just rehearsed. Yeah. You know, like, what do you think was supposed to happen? Like, <laughs> like, like all the time, like these like jazz legends drop these uh these bombs of nuggets on you that right. no one ever dropped before. And Chick was saying, like, one thing that made Miles Davis such a genius is that Herbie said the same things. Like, Miles never really gave you a straight answer. He would always tell you something to make you figure out the answer on your own. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a lot of great leaders do that. So yeah. um, that that's a long way of saying after playing with Chick Corea all these years, the thought of him having played with Miles Davis really stopped coming to my mind like after like the second or third gig. Mm. It, because mm. at some point you got to focus on the gig. I'm right. playing with Chick Corea. <laughs> right. You know, I'm not worried about what Chick Corea did with Miles Davis right at this moment. He right. just put a hard ass piece of music in front of my face. <laughs> now I have to learn that. The question is not how would Miles have approached this? Right. It's right. how do I how do I make this work for Chick Corea's group? You hey, Chris, because Miles ain't playing that bass up there on the bandstand. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> exactly but, right. But, but Chick told me when he first got with the, the gig, right? First yeah. gig, I think, was in Boston. Right. Uh, uh, Baltimore, I think he said. Baltimore? Okay. Yeah, they didn't, yeah. Did he tell you the story? They didn't rehearse anything? And no so rehearsal. Right. <laughs> Miles was at the bar, and Chick was sitting at the other end of the bar, and Miles just said, Nice touch. <laughs> that was it. Yeah, right, that right, was it. That's right. Nice yeah. touch. Right. And, you that and, yeah. He, he also told me he said, "Uh, like, like my, like you know, no rehearsal. He just showed up for the gig. Yeah. And he's yeah. like, Miles, what do you want me to play? You know, he's like, play what you hear. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> right. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. And he said that first set, man. You know, because Tony was still in the group and. uh Chick said, you know, he was just like, oh, man, this is like, this is the band. Yeah. Like, oh, my God. Yeah. He said, man, as soon as they counted that first song off, man, he said he, like, held on to the piano stool, man, because it's, it's just Miles and Tony just. Off to the race. Rocket ship. Yeah, yeah. man. Yeah. Yep. But just like that, Christian, when you were a chick, you know, it's off. You know, you don't have time yeah. to really. My first night with Miles was. At Long Beach Jazz Fest, and on the side of the stage was Freddie White from Earth, Wind, and Fire, Woo! Jack Dejanet, I think Dave Weckle. It was it was the Long Beach Jazz Fest. <laughs> right, right. I, I didn't even want to look over there. You know, I didn't no. want to look yeah. over there. I just had to focus on the music. You know, that's right, man. Yeah, you yeah, got to focus yeah. on the gig at yeah, hand. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, man. Wow. You know, speaking of the bass in specific, you know, I mentioned I'm a trumpet player, and so when I was coming up, listening to Miles, I'm listening. Kind of a weird way to say it, but through the ears of a trumpet player, you know, I'm listening for Miles' technique. And I'm curious, as a bass player, listening to Miles Davis, were you listening for things like how he would lock in with a bassist and what his bassists were doing to kind of support him? First of all, I think Miles, I mean, you talk about time yeah. and playing with the rhythm section. Yeah. You see, I, as a rhythm section player, I, I know Vince, he, he'll attest to this. Um, when you play with horn players who have good time and who can lock in with the rhythm section, it makes our job so much more fun. Yeah. You know, like I, I, I can't, I, I, it's hard for me to play with non rhythm section players who like to float on top of the beat. They even say it themselves. They're like, Oh, you know, like the rhythm section is doing their thing. And therefore I can kind of float on the top. Right. right. And I, I'm like, look, stop floating. Be, be in there with us. Yeah, you know what I mean? yeah, yeah. And uh man, the way Miles has always played time. Yes. Um, there's this one, um, there's this recording of Miles at the Newport Jazz Festival. I think it's from uh 66, maybe. And um they had just started playing gingerbread boy because okay. you know miles smiles they kind of play it kind of fast but on this newport gig they play it kind of slow which makes me think that they just kind of learning it like you know mm -hmm. they just they just started playing it and um 
Miles' first two courses, you know, Tony's kind of back there dancing. You know, he's doing this thing, you know, just mm -hmm. playing all kinds of stuff. And just Miles, through his trumpet, he made this really amazing kind of signal like, okay, here's the time, and now we're going to swing, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Young blood on the drums. You know, I know <laughs> you love Tony. Mm -hmm. I know you love Tony. That was oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. But my Miles just plays like these quarter like, like these uh bip, 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 and like just the time was just so strong. That was the, signal. That was the JB hand signal. Yeah. Yeah. That's the, that was the yeah. JB hand signal, yeah. man. Yeah. And and um yeah, I, I mean obviously I love the way Miles plays time. He's yeah. always swinging. I mean, yeah. even when he's when he's funking, yeah. uh, he's right mm -hmm. in the pocket. Mm -hmm. But uh nobody tells a story. Nobody tells a story. Nobody takes the uh no, nobody brings more of a human emotional element to to music like Miles did, particularly yeah. as a trumpet player. Right. And you know, early in my career, like Freddie Hubbard was the first gig that I had that really gave me some some credibility on the larger scale yeah. in the jazz world. So I'm always going to be a Freddie Hubbard man because he, yes. he gave me my first chance. Yeah. But um, even Freddie would say like it, it like, well, you know, Miles. You know, Miles is the cat. You know what I mean? Yeah. Nobody, nobody's ever going to play a ballad on the trumpet like Miles Davis. They're just not. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? No, the emotion, just the single yeah. note. You know, and yet I've always thought, just like you were saying, there was some part of Miles' brain that was a drummer brain. Yes, just his t in terms of time. You know, and he he always had this special relationship. I felt with drummers. You know, it was a mind meld. And so that's why I was just curious if, you know, I'm sure he had something with the basses too. So as a basis, what you're listening to is how he interacted with the bass. But, you know, with everyone in his group, it was just so much trust. You know, that's what it was. It was like you could go anywhere and anyone in the group would follow, you know. I love seeing pictures of the old quintet and uh, Miles is often standing near Ron Carter. And he even yeah. says it in his autobiography that, you know, back in those days, there were no bass amps, you know, right. so mm -hmm. he would always stand near Ron and hear what he was playing. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, there's another photo. I, I found this. I, I found a copy of um, a vinyl copy of Miles Live in Tokyo, the 1964 gig with, with Sam Rivers. Mm -hmm. right? And if you look at the photo on the inside of the album cover, the setup is bizarre. Like Ron is up in the front line basically standing in between miles and wayne I, i'm sorry <laughs> My, miles and sam sam rivers yeah and, mm. and um you see like there was a there was like a little uh um uh, tinder block there with a microphone on it to come right up to ron's f hole on the base yeah and i'm looking at it thinking obviously they did this strictly because of the recording setup mm -hmm. they wanted to you know have a little bit of separation between the bass and the drums mm -hmm. but uh I mean, I'm pretty sure that Miles was kind of like, oh, this is awesome. I, Ron's, <laughs> right, Ron's right next to me. I can hear him, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree that Miles, I, I'm, I'm guessing that he was always, more than anything else, so in tune with the drums and the bass, man. Yeah. You know, it's like, the he battery. knew like, I had that bedrock. Yeah, yeah. You know? exactly, man. He loved bass players, too. Love bass players. I can imagine. Love bass players. Woo, yeah. And now, Christian, man, when you were playing with some of these cats, because I know Freddie gave you your first big break, really, you were like, you were a teenager, right? Mm -hmm. Were you in Juilliard at the time or not quite yet even? No, no, no. I I, I, um, I left Juilliard after my, my first and, and only year. Okay. And uh, that so that was in the, the spring, late spring of 1990. And uh, I joined Freddie Hubbard's band in August of '90, so I, I was uh, I was 18. I just turned 18. Gotcha. gotcha. Who was in Freddie's band, Christian? Carl Allen was still playing drums. Ooh, yeah. Benny Green was playing piano, and Don Braden on tenor sax. Okay. And my first gig with the quintet was at the South Shore Jazz Festival. Wow! Wow! <laughs> Chicago! Chicago! Yep. Wow! Yep. Wow! Wow! Very cool, man. I'm good, but that's an education in its own right you know, is playing with those veteran cats, oh, you yeah. know, and do you, are you seeing that as much anymore, you know, of, of that intergenerational conversation? You know, that's a good question, man, because I, I thought of something that kind of freaked me out 
like, so when, when I moved to New York in 1989, I started playing. My, my very first gig in New York was with Bobby Watson. And okay. I, I was 17. Bobby Watson at that time was probably 36, 35 or 36 years old. <laughs> and at that time, I thought, man. Bobby Watson, he's an OG, man. He played <laughs> with Art man. Blakey in the yeah. 70s. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At all of 36 years old. Yeah, yeah. man. I was like, man, this cat's been around for a long time. Like, you know, him and James Williams, oh, Victor Lewis, man, mm. they was making records with the cats, you know, like, you know, like, I did not think of them as like, I certainly didn't think of them as like, you know, uh, um, sage type elders, right, right. but they mm-hmm. surely mm-hmm. weren't your young lions either. Mm-hmm. They were OGs, and so, yeah. And so like, here I am. I'm I'm 48 years old now. So going back to that time, cats like Chick, Herbie Hancock, Jack DeJanet, they were all like 48, 49 mm. in 1989, right? Mm-hmm. So here I am, 48 now. I'm wondering if some young cat, 17 years old, he's like, damn, Christian McBride was making records in the 90s, right? <laughs> so like now, n- now it, it comes. You know, you you see the. The, the circles is, is unbroken. So um, I, I think the, I think the scene has changed uh, for a number of different reasons. Um, I don't get the sense that that many cats live in New York like they used to. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like when I moved to New York in 89, like there were a huge like cats I listened to on records. Most of them lived in New York, mm-hmm. whereas that might not be quite the case anymore. I mean, they, you know, cats still somewhat like live near New York, but, you know, uh, Branford Marcellus moved to North Carolina. Uh, Jeff Tane Watts lives in Pennsylvania. Um, you know, uh, uh, Terry Lynn Carrington moved to Boston. So like there's a, there's like a lot of cats are just spread out now. Yeah. You you're know? talking veteran cats, the veteran v- cats. Veteran cats. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Along the West coast. Yeah. And, and so, uh, I often feel like sometimes like, um, you know, I look at I look at like some of the young cats coming onto the scene now, and <laughs> I, I, I say this lovingly, but it looks like a classroom with no teacher. Mm. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. um, so that that's why I've always, um, you know, I enjoy working with younger people. I right. enjoy um, not just showing them the notes; they can figure out the notes. That's the easy part knowing all of the stuff behind the notes, all of these stories, all these anecdotes, how we got to be where we are. Because every, everybody thinks, everyone seems to think it was easy for the person they look up to. Right. Oh, well, you exactly. had this, you had that. We don't have this, so therefore you can't expect the same thing from us. Which is, you know, that's a cop-out. That's just that's just pure laziness. But um, um, I enjoy working with the younger musicians and... Um, when veteran musicians really kind of go out of their way to, well, you know, kind of in a way, I'm not sure older musicians, we, we, when we go out of our way to kind of show the young cats the ropes, I actually think it's the other way around. The younger cats should be seeking out the veteran cats mm-hmm. to show them the ropes because mm-hmm. when I came to New York City, I wasn't expecting Ron Carter to come and find me and say, oh, I've been hearing about you, young man. I want to spend some time with you. Right, it was right. my job to go to Ron Carter and say, yeah. oh, Sage, Mr. Carter, please, you know, <laughs> an- anoint me. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so, uh, you know, I urge a lot of these younger musicians, you know, to kind of, you know, I know in America, this is a youth oriented society. And uh, once you get past a certain age, nobody seems to really care about your opinion anymore, but ignore that and, and go find some of these older cats to rap to talk to Vince Wilburn Jr. You know what I mean? He played with Miles Davis. He's Miles Davis's blood. He saw and experienced things you only hear about or see clips of three or four minute clips on YouTube, you know? Right. So go find him, go find Ron Carter, go find, uh, Jack D. Jeanette and Roy Haynes. So they don't even have to be that old. Go find Brian Blade. Go find go, Lenny, go find Lenny White. All Lenny White. Uh, uh, Lewis Nash. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, Brad Meldow, Joshua Redman. Go find them. And, and you know what, Christian? When I when I want to know about art, I talk to Roy. Thank God he's you know he's with us, and I can talk to Roy. I could talk to Ralph Peterson. Yes. You know, I talk to Tane. I mean, but but. 
we're still students. We still I'm have a lot of music. Right. And, and we got to let, let the youngsters, young cats know, young ladies and men, yep. that we're assess accessible. You know, yes. it's not like we can't, we can't share what we learn. And, and right. people should know that, you know? Yeah, right. indeed. I, I watched indeed. you working with, with uh, Quincy. Uh, oh, Quincy Phillips. Uh, oh, that's my man. He called uh, me. He called I, me I love him. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's just the, you know, the, the past, the, you know, reaching out. You know? yeah. That's right. That's what right. You do. Yeah. yeah. And you're doing it in a major way, Christian, with Jazz House Kids. So is anything going on with Jazz House Kids? You're kind of on hiatus here with, uh, you know, everything that's going on with the virus or what's... Well, no, not really. We, we moved all of our classes online. Okay. So, right know, on. just, yeah. just like just like everybody else, we're living our lives on, on Zoom chats and, you know, yeah. every day we're on the laptops, you know. Yeah. 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 All right, man. Well, that's a beautiful thing. Hey, we've got a couple questions here. Um, let's see if we could go back and dig in. Our Rune watching watching on YouTube wants to know about one Miles Davis collaborator. We'd love to hear Christian talk about his collaboration with George Duke. Man, oh, some yeah. of the funkiest stuff out there. Man, he he became my uh, he became my second father, pretty much. Wow. Um, out of, out of all of the great, like you know, legendary jazz artists that I had a chance to play with. Uh, my, my, probably my greatest influence and the person who spent the most time, I spent the most time with was Ray Brown. And um, Ray Brown started a band called Super Bass uh, with myself and John Clayton. So to be able to actually be in a band with someone I admired right. that much yeah. is, uh, was a great honor. And Somewhere in the late 90s, I was, I was about to make my third record for Verve, and um, I wanted to play, I just, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to get funky. You know, I, I was really starting to get tired of everyone saying, oh, Christian McBride, the young lion, the Ray Brown protege, the, the, the mm -hmm. straight ahead practitioner, you know, it's like, did they really believe that? It's like, it's like is that what I... Is that kind of what I gave off? Because I was playing with a lot of other people you know, other than just straight ahead cats, but that's kind of where I made my name, you know? Right. Um, like nobody ever made me to, thought of me to be an electric bass player, even though I played electric bass with Freddie. Yeah. I played electric bass with Joshua Redman, you know? Right. But I actually never had been on a funk gig, you know? Right. Um, and so when it came time for me to make my third album on Verve, which was called A Family Affair, um, we were looking for a producer and we were like, man, who, uh, who kind of knows what you're going for? You know, you have jazz pedigree, but you also have funk pedigree. You have right. classical pedigree, you know, you're a well-rounded musician. And, um, George Duke popped up and mm. we we're like, Oh, that makes perfect sense. Now let me paint this picture for you. And because y'all remember in 1998, George Duke, was not known, particularly in the New York circles, like the New York sort of snooty intellectual jazz circle, right? George Duke was known as like a West Coast smooth jazz guy, right? Right, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And like nobody who was like in the belly of the hard hardcore New York scene, other than some of the older cats, like older cats, like like who were his contemporaries, cats like John Hicks and Kirk Lightsey, they mm. knew, right? But like. I always knew George Duke. I mean, I loved his records in the all his funk records from the seventies, all the all the Clark Duke stuff, the the Cobham Duke stuff. Yeah, I loved and knew all that stuff. But I loved his stuff with Cannibal Adderley. I loved his stuff with Frank Zappa. Right. I right. loved his stuff with with Nancy Wilson and Joe Williams. So I knew how much of a hardcore jazz guy he was. Yeah, yeah. And um, he played in that era that I've been completely fascinated with, like that early seventies era when the young cats coming on the scene at that time were kind of like, ooh, do we stick with the straight ahead that we've been learning or do we go with yeah. this new fusion thing? You know yeah. what I mean? And mm -hmm. so like that era is fascinating to me, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, when I met George Duke, man, um, he really did become the next, he, he became like my next second dad after Ray Brown. Um, um, and I actually think that at least I like to believe that George felt this sense of, wow, a young lion straight ahead jazz guy wants to work with me. 
Mm. Wow, this is you know I you know n none of you hardcore jazz cats ever give me no love, so right. I'm honored you want to work with me. So it was really we were good for each other, you know. And um, after he produced Family Affair, I think I played on every last one of his records for the right. rest of his career. I think I played on all but all but two. But um, George was like, "Hey man, you know, I started making gigs with his band, and um, I would play acoustic, electric." keyboard bass and background singing you know? <laughs> gotta do it all man because he know? did too yeah <laughs> he was like no you ain't got to worry about none of that that young lion jazz stuff if you don't want to with me you, nah, can, you can be all of you george he was a beautiful soul man. yeah he was he was fearless man he yeah. man fearless. i miss george so much man and you're right that was kind of a fascinating era because it kind of it was like a fusion but it was more like a popular music fusion that kind of ran parallel to the rock, jazz, rock, right. punk fusion. That's right. You know, yeah. and all those cats from like Stuff, Richard T. Yeah, man, they were kind of lost to time. But um, yeah, George played with Miles on Tutu, right? Well, a, bunch, a couple records. He, he, wrote a, he wrote. A, he wrote a composition called Backyard Ritual. Yeah. Yes. And he had yeah. a bunch of bunch of songs he was submitting, and he sat in with us at Montreal, you know, wow. and was killing. Yeah. Killing. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And, and it's a keyboard bass. You know, you strap right. it around. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's footage of it on YouTube. I think we wrote we wrote over to get something. We were together right before the, the concert, and he was just you know he was you could you could feel it that he was going to heat it up. You know, oh, Miles yeah. gave him oh, yeah. room to stretch, man. He he, he tore it up, man. Yeah, you know, man. Love George, man. And I think uh, I think it was uh, Kenny Garrett told me a story um, that they like they were on on traveling to a gig or something like that or. I can't remember who it was, but anyway, um, Miles says something like, uh, "Man, that George George Duke is a, that's a bad another <laughs> M. Yeah, the word of the day. Him. The word of the day. Yeah, he, right. he does that's George, right. man. He really yeah. does George, Christian. You know? Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. And, and, and and see, people don't know that all you all Uncle Miles wanted you to do is play. Right. You right. know, he, you know, he and he wanted you to try things, and and that's that's the key to all of this. Yeah. yeah. You know? Christian, you don't get locked into. You're a hell of an upright cat. You play the funk, but you know, there's like like Wayne Shorter says, without a net. You know, I always Not refer to that. You know, you got to go right. for it, man. That's you gotta right. Go for it. Got to go and, for it. Well, let me, yeah. I have a question. Um, you know, like 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 sitting with Ray Brown and 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 you know what was that like? I mean, you you know you're young and you like it's Ray Brown, you know. Yeah. When I when I was hanging with Tony and Jack, oh, I couldn't even say shit. I couldn't even yeah. talk. I, I was like, "No, same here, man." A ask Ron. Ask Ron. I would just stare at him like this. Yeah, and we oh, I feel half the time on this show, Vince. Come on. <laughs> like, but what? What? You know, like Ray Brown, man. I mean, come on. Oh man, John, it's, it's, John Clayton, man. I mean, you know. yeah. No, same thing, man. I I I had a hard time speaking with Ray Brown. Speaking to Ray Brown for like two or three years, and that's while I was playing in Super Bass. I don't know what to ask him. You know, I'm this young, dumb kid. You know, I got the great Ray Brown. This man played with with Bird. You know, yeah. yeah. This man yeah. played with. This man was married to Ella Fitzgerald. Played with Frank Sinatra, Oscar Peterson. I I have nothing to offer in this conversation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. 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 um, but he, he. I was playing a gig with um, my dear friend, the pianist Benny Green. And uh, hey, Ray Brown, yeah, that's oh, right. Yeah. And um, our manager at the time was very close with Ray Brown. She said, I'm going to bring Ray to come hear you guys tonight. And this was in 1991. And uh, sure enough, Ray Brown uh, walked in the club and Benny and I, we were just, we were scared to death, man. You know, mm -hmm. it was the great Ray Brown. You know, and here we are playing our stuff. Like, oh man, this is, oh wow. <laughs> and so, uh, after the set was over, we went and sat with him, and um, he liked what he heard. He was very nice to us, very complimentary. And uh, as fate would have it, Benny Green wound up replacing Gene Harris in Ray's trio less than a year later, and um, and then he created Super Bass not too long after that. And um, man, what, what what can I say about Ray? Man, it's just like that. There's old school and then there's old school. Like mm -hmm. Ray Brown was like, you know, 40s, 50s old school, you know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, him and your Uncle Miles were contemporaries. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. in, in fact, in uh, Miles' autobiography, 
he daps Ray Brown up pretty big at one point. And that was surprising because, like, it's rare that – because, you know, I don't think Ray and Miles had a chance to play together that much mm-hmm. once a- mm-hmm. after the 1940s. Mm-hmm. But um, I remember Miles said in his book, he said, I remember when Ray Brown came to Minton's Playhouse – and killed everybody with his bass playing, you know. Yeah. And I remember yeah. thinking, like, wow, Miles really gave it up to Ray Brown. You yeah. Know? Wow, yeah. yeah. And he, and, and he uh, loved and Mingus too. He loved Mingus. Yep, yep. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And uh man, I man, I what can I say about Ray, man? He was just uh he he felt like a dad, but but he he was he was the same age as my grandfather, so he's probably more like a granddad than a dad, but um yeah, man, he was always uh He's another one of those cats. He de- he demystified everything. You know, he's like, mm. I was like, oh, you know, Ray, um, how do you and Oscar Peterson remember all of those uh, all those arrangements y'all had, man? I mean, that's that's crazy. He'd be like, we rehearsed a lot. <laughs> it was kind of like, yeah, yeah. duh, right? right. Yeah. Doctor yeah. Ronald Doctor Ronald Carter said he sat in with you in, in Central Park with George Duke. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He just sent me. A- I remember that. <laughs> I think right. that was my first gig with George, with with his band, George Duke's actual band. Wow, who's playing wow. drums? Billy Kilson played on that. Ooh, on okay, that okay, okay, yeah, okay. yeah. Yep. BK, yeah, yep, yep, yeah. Ray, man, to me, when I close my eyes, I picture the sound of jazz bass. That's Ray. That's just the warmest, most human tone on that bass that he got. Yeah, that's Jeez. what killed me. Yeah, the first time yeah. I sat in front of him and heard him play. I thought that's what an acoustic bass is supposed yeah. to sound like. <laughs> yes. That yes, perfect yes. balance of wood, flesh, yeah. and steel. Woody. Yeah, man. Yeah. Yep. It sounds human. Yeah. Um, people want to know of, about your collaborations, man. Somebody wanted to know about, let's see if I could pull it up. Ah, Giancarlo. Is this Giancarlo? Giancarlo wants to know about another Miles Davis collaborator and another bassist working with Sting. Mm-hmm. You know, working with Sting. Sting strikes me as a cat who knows his jazz. Who know, you know, he's a serious student of music. Oh, big time. Big yeah. time. The, the man's a uh he's a sponge. He knows a lot about a lot of things. A true Renaissance man. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I enjoyed every moment I had playing with him. I mean, you know, we we still keep in touch. We haven't worked together in a while, but um the last time we played together was um I guess it was for his 60th birthday bash. Um, at the Beacon Theater a few years back. Nice. And um, yeah, man, he, he, when I first started playing with him, um, I was actually kind of curious myself because I thought, you know, is he going to play bass? Is he not going to play bass? Am I going to double? Right. Like, what, how, how is this going to work? So um, my first gig with him was in Europe, in, in Italy, and um, he flew me over maybe like a week before the rest of the band since I was the new guy. And so I could learn the arrangements and things like that with just me and him. And um, originally he said that he wanted me to play um, both. He said, I want you to play acoustic and electric and I'm probably not going to play at all, you know, but um, as things progressed, he, he did play a little and then I played mostly um, acoustic bass and on stuff that he would play on, um, sometimes I would double him. Sometimes I would play like an obligato part, like almost like a like a cello part. Hmm. So it was interesting trying to find you know different ways to make it work. Right. You know. Right. But Sting can lay it down. Sting oh, absolutely, down. absolutely. Oh, yeah. Cool. Well, hey, we will kind of wrap things up with this um, question from Shawnee Harris on YouTube, and it's just uh, who are some up and coming musicians you may be digging right now, you know, we're all locked down doing a lot of listening or maybe not even up and coming who just, who you've been spinning a lot lately. What have you been getting into while we're here on lockdown, not going anywhere? Well, there are a a slew of amazing up and coming musicians now, man. Too many I can think of, uh, there's Joel Ross, great vibraphone. He's from, from your, from your town, Vince. He's from Chicago Chicago guy. That's right. That's right. So, uh, yeah, Joel is bad. Uh, I want you to keep an eye out for this bad young sister on the drums named Savannah Harris. Okay. Um, she can play. Um, young man named Julius Rodriguez. He plays piano, 
but uh, he's one of these uh, annoyingly freakishly talented kids that can play a little bit of everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, annoyingly. Too much talent. Annoyingly, yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> um, Alexa Tarantino, young lady, who plays great alto saxophone. Nice player, yeah, beautiful. Um, gosh, man. Um, he's not really – I mean, he, he's been around a little bit now, but Emmett Cohen, who's played uh, with me a little bit. He's a friend of um, ours, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Christian Sands goes without saying. His, his career is already rolling at this point, so um, – uh, but man, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of good talent out there. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thanks for sharing, Christian. Man, this has been awesome. It's so much fun talking to you. Thank about, you for having me. Oh, our pleasure, man. Thank you for the stories. Thank you for the insight. This has been incredible. We should again the new album for Jimmy Wes and Oliver coming out September 25th. Mac Avenue Records, right? Yes. You've dropped a few singles. Don is Pie Blues. Swing. That's right. Swing. Thank you very much. I love it. I love it, Deep. Christian. Love yeah. it, man. Yeah. Hey, Vince, I'm down there. one Come of these on, days, man. man We're gonna get some, man. Come on, let's get it. Let's get it. Let's get it. Let's get it up in Newport, man. And <laughs> hey, we go. gonna we gonna we gonna make it. We're gonna okay. make it happen. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Everybody, y'all heard this. Y'all heard it. Keep it to it. Keep, <laughs> it. Keep it to That's it. That's right. It. No, it's in public now. <laughs> no, we gonna, you, man. we gonna make that happen. Hey Christian, thank you, man. Thank you so My much. Pleasure. Man. You know, I love Anytime, you. I'm, man. I'm gonna be joining you with, on on Sunday, next Sunday on the game. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Don't we play you guys this season? We coming at you, baby. I think so. Let me check. <laughs> okay. Look out. Hopefully we have better news next time. That's I'm right. a Dolphins fan, so I don't, you know. I'm oh, yeah, going. You, you, you. Oh, I don't have anything good to look forward to. Come back anytime, Christian. Anytime. Yeah, Thank you, brother. The pleasure. Yeah, we will see you backstage, man. So yes. long. Later. Love you, brother. Take care. All right. Beautiful episode, Vince. Yeah, Another man. successful Miles Monday. Yeah, B. From one bad mrf -er, That word of the day. That's, That's it. That's a good That's one. <laughs> Knocking them down like dominoes. That's right. Who we got coming up next? Next week, I believe, is Charles Tolliver. Ooh, yes, CT. Charles. CT. That's right. CT. That's right. And then September, what is it, the 28th? Trumpet we, Summit. We're going to be putting together a Trumpet Summit. And we want to know, people watching, who would you like to see on this Trumpet, Trumpet Summit? We're starting to put this panel together now, but we want your input as well because we love hearing from you. Yeah. Vince, thanks again for another Miles Monday, sir. Happy birthday to Nasir Jones. Nasir Nas. Jones, rapper Nas, another lover of Miles Davis. And we worked on the evolution of the groove together, man. It's Illmatic, baby. It's Bad Illmatic. man. <laughs> Love you, B. All right, shout Vince. Out, shout out to Jeff behind the scenes. Where are you, Jeff? Producer Jeff, producer Jeff, holding producer it down Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> behind the scenes. Jazz is, man. Love. That's right. Check us out at jazzis.com. Check my, uh, the Miles Davis store out. Where can they do that, Vince? MilesDavis.com, baby. That's shop. right. MilesDavis.com. MilesDavisShop.com. Where you move, man. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Stay healthy, everyone. Stay healthy. We'll see you soon. Peace out. Thanks for watching. Peace. Love you, B. So long.